this talk. Uh, please welcome uh, Sam Chowdhury, who's going to talk to the uh, Federer and Silver Loom. I'm particularly excited because I've got a Federer 28, which uh, really needs upgrading. So <laughs> I'm hoping he's going to do a great sales job. Yeah, um, I'm sure I hope will. so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Uh, like, I will be audible, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so one of the primary uh, thing that I will be talking about in this afternoon, today afternoon, is how I migrated to uh, my primary, migrated my uh, primary workstation to a completely con into container based development workstation. And uh, the primary thing that I would be targeting is the Silverboot project that was recently released. So I'm really excited, right? Because, uh, so let me tell you a story on how I actually migrated to Silverblue. So uh, I have been working on uh, web-based development uh, for around like five, six years now. And most of my development was around uh, vagrant boxes. So for every work that I did, it was usually I used to write vagrant boxes because I wanted to segregate all my environments for each, on each and every project. And over time, my laptop was slowly becoming uh, too overloaded with all those vagrant boxes in place. And because uh, Fedora, if you know, has a lot of projects in, uh, in the infrastructure. So to context switch into a different project, it used to become a lot heavier on the laptop side. So I was looking for something um, really innovative in that case. So, um, and at that point of time, I also started to look into the containers world, and I also started working with the Fedora Code OS team. So this gave me a chance to look into the container world. And uh, around the same time, there was this talk by Jesse Prasil on how she has this complete workstation on every, how she runs every application on uh, as a Docker container, right, and runcy container. So she gave a talk on a couple of conferences about this. So this gave me a motivation on to look into uh, this container-based development workflow. So I was looking into my options, and then when I uh, I was hit with uh, Silverblue. So I'm really excited to give this talk because I want to share on what all things I learned over this last couple of months of migrating to Silverblue, and I'll share a couple of. Uh, so my talk would go from like how Silverblue uh, works behind the scenes and how is my work development looks like from uh, on a day-to-day -day life. And uh, finally, I would also like to uh, end this talk a bit, like a five minutes before, because I wanted to ha have a discussion around the topic so that we get more feedback, because uh, Silverblue is currently in a development stage, so a lot of feature would be coming in in the future releases, so it's better to get the development developers' feedback on this. So yeah, so I am Sain Chaudhary. I work with the Fedora engineering team, and I'm also working with the Fedora Core OS team currently. I have been a Python developer for around uh, 10 years now, and recently with the Fedora Core, working with Fedora Core OS team, I started to work on Golang projects as well. And uh, Yudoka is my Twitter handle. So options. Right now we have a bunch of options out there. We uh, so this project was uh, so. Around 20, uh, so the project early started with a project if you have heard known of is Fedora Atomic, so which was uh, ha which had two parts to it. One was the Atomic Workstation, and the other was the Atomic Server project that we had. And uh, so after the Coreus acquisition, we migrated the name to uh, Silverblue. And on the other side, also we have other uh, projects like Container Linux, which uh, is Gentoo based. We also have Endless OS, which is Debian based. But uh, because Fedora is part of my occupational hazard, so I went ahead with using Fedora Silverblue. So yeah, so uh, I'll uh, start off with introducing Fedora Silverblue now. So yeah, so the main part is it is based out of Fedora. So you have all your RPMs in place, it's RPM based. So uh, anything that you, uh, so the migration, if you do from Fedora, uh, traditional Fedora OS to uh, Silverblue, it won't be a much of a difference. You would see uh, everything as like almost same. It won't feel like you have migrated to a completely new territory. Uh, but there are a few quirks to it also, like since it's uh, again on the development side, so you might uh, find some pain point. 
but it's usually not that much. So uh, again, uh, we since I have been uh, using Fedora for like I started in 2010, so it's been my de facto OS for a couple of years now, and that's why like I trust Fedora. I use uh, uh, Fedora-based uh, operating systems in my servers or uh, be it my desktop right now. Yeah. So. Uh, Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the main thing uh, about uh, Silverblue is uh, by if you uh, see the traditional Fedora OS, uh, it's like so if you work on a server, suppose you are working on your server and uh, you usually have Ansible playbooks in place so and to maintain that integrity so that when you uh, want to upgrade your servers, you want that to happen in a uh, proper way. You have uh, playbooks or like in place. So one of the thing is you don't want to uh, touch uh, something in production and break it, right? So uh, when you're doing some uh, live coding, you usually have some testing in place in your staging and then when everything is right, you move your code to production. So why not move all those things to your workstation as well? As uh, I used to work with uh, my traditional Fedora OS, in that case I used to random uh, use, like if I want to install a package, I used to download random packages off the internet, some random tarball, go through the readme and start um, copying, copy pasting all the uh, files into different locations. And what happens after, suppose uh, you hit a step where you can't do anything right uh, after that, or the package breaks or if it's not working. So you just leave the computer in that state where, uh, it has random files which are kind of junk and no use to you. And similarly, if you see from the RPM side, when you do a DNF install, it's kind of dangerous because you are changing files which are actually running a system. So it can cause troubles to you. And one of the reason for me, I would say one of the example I feared upgrade in Fedora was what happens if the power goes off. And Bangalore is quite famous for its power uh, outages. So I used to fear like what happens if the power goes off and my DNF upgrade is in place. My system would completely uh, be uh, in a state where I cannot boot, even boot my system. So in that case, um, those all things had to be uh, thought of in some way or the other. So uh, this is one thing that uh, Silverblue totally addresses it. So you have transactional updates. Uh, so just one thing that I wanted to show, this is reported by one of the uh, uh, QA, he's one of the uh, go-to person in the Fedora QA, Adam Williams, and he posted like, do not upgrade your system while running uh, DNF from your desktop. So this is a blog that he did, it is excerpt from his blog. So he as a uh, QA person who is the most experienced probably in the Fedora QA, he is telling people that not to run DNF right now because there are a few issues. So uh, these are the things uh, which can cause trouble in the long run. So so one of the thing is like, if you are looking for a more stable system, I would say like, this is the path you, we should be going ahead with our system in general. The next thing is immutability and isolation. So uh, as I told you, I used to use Vagrant boxes. And uh, at the end of the day, the Vagrant boxes uh, were something I used because I did not want to touch my host system. And this goes to back to my using virtual ENV in Python. So the reason for virtual ENV is that I don't want to pip install as a root user into my uh, host machine because First thing, the packages can be dangerous. You cannot trust the package completely. And what if the if there was an issue with uh, cheese, uh, cheese shop in Python that there were a few mal malicious packages that came in into the uh, cheese shop. So you might be installing by mistake some malicious packages that could uh, uh, target your host system. So uh, that's where I started to use virtual ENV and later down the line Vagrant boxes where, where I separately like I, I have like probably a couple of packages like my editor, um, uh, uh, a couple of packages like my virtual machine set setups and my editor and all those things in place. But other than that, all the projects 
environment are there in the vagrant boxes. So uh, another beneficial uh, thing for this uh, setup is that you can, so pr probably uh, it can be like a project A can require a version of a package which is an older version of that particular depend uh, package which is a dependency. And on the other side you have an, a package which is uh, other project which requires a newer version of the dependency. So you cannot install the same package with two different versions. So in that case you go ahead with using virtual ends or vagrant boxes. So and so this is one of the uh, thing for isolation. As a developer, we always go for isolation. This is a very common scenario. And uh, this can be totally uh, be handled by a container, which is a more lighter weight solution to this problem. And uh, then comes the immutability part. So uh, this issue was posted a couple, uh, couple of years back where the author actually by mistake put a, a space in between the command. So, so at the end of the day, it was like rm rf instead of slash user slash lib, it was slash. It was completely uh, deleting the USR directory. So this was a big risk. And what if you are on your host machine? If you run this command, you like if you see that this actually caught issue to a lot of people. And by the emojis that you see, that it was like very famous issue at that time. So these are problems usually come in, like we are humans, we do mistakes. Uh, and because of these mistakes, it's usually the host machine is getting affected. So uh, in Silverblue, we have uh, the only the var and xc directory is only writable, and all the other system is kind of in the read-only mode. So uh, there's only one thing that uh, the option that is left to you is uh, using containers. So the prom uh, so Silverblue by its nature promotes you to use more of container based development. So uh, you can be using each and every application within the uh, within an container framework, be it your browser, be it your, uh, uh, be it your, uh, maybe your servers and etc. So you, uh, it forces you to kind of use the uh, container environment. So this is one of, uh, now going into the internals of the project. Uh, the project heavily uses RPM OS3, which is kind of the core of uh, the Silverblue project. And it's the same for the Fedora core OS also. And uh, what is RPM OS3? So RPM OS3 is built around the RPM. So if you go by uh, how the project is built, it's basically uh, it uses a lib, uh, lib OS3 uh, project which kind of what it does to your system is that it makes your complete system at a, as a git version system so you basically have a couple of uh, versions to your system and i'll just give you a small demo around it so is this is this visible yeah, yeah. So uh, if you see like this is, if you see this dot, this is the current system that is running and there is a hash to it. So the, because this is a con uh, content addressable uh, uh, object store. So what it does is that it, uh, for every deployment that you do, it downloads the RPM, creates an image out of it, hashes all the files, sees if uh, the files are reduplicated or not. In that case, it intelligently solves the issue of not downloading the uh, same files again and again and uh, does uh, and also via hard link it does not re it's kind of reduplicates the file so basically you have this hash in place and uh, this is the current uh, system i am in and this is the older system i am in so when you do a rpm os3 upgrade so what happens is that it does not affect your current system and in place it creates a new deployment this is uh, like you would see in that case three deployments and then when you do a reboot of the system you would finally migrate into the newer os and if the new os breaks you also you usually have the option you have the option to migrate into the older one so and um, uh, silverblue comes with a base uh, base image os and on top of that if you see these are the uh, these are the rpms is uh, these are the RPMs that I installed. So it 
works as a layer. So it, uh, if you know about the container layer system, it keeps on uh, layering uh, the new uh, RPMs that I installed. So this gives you a good idea on which other packages are installed in a system. You can always overwrite them or remove them, and uh, and that would uh, make your system kind of atomic in nature. So uh, if you want to, so if two machines have the same packages installed, you probably would get the same bugs if you have, and you can probably go ahead and uh, file those issues. And another thing is, uh, if you see, these are the local packages. So these are the packages that I did not install for, uh, these are the packages I did not install from directly uh, from the uh, federal repo, rather I installed it locally. So this gives you a good overview on how the system works. So moving ahead. So how does this help the developer? Uh, as a developer, uh, if I'm pitching uh, Silver Blue to you, so these are the things that would, you would be finding useful. This mostly comes with all the uh, container engine. Uh, there's Docker, there's Podman. I personally use uh, Podman for the uh, non-rootless non for the rootless containers because in, and also Podman is very light because it has the daemonless. It runs daemonless, so you, in the Docker you have the da daemon running continuously. So uh, I personally use Podman for all my containers, and then you have Builder. I have not used it much, but I have heard a lot from the people. It basically creates the uh, OCI images for you. And uh, the next thing is Scopio. So Scopio is another project uh, built by Red Hat to inspect and uh, manage your images. So uh, these all projects come with along with the Silverblue project. Another concept with comes that has been introduced with Silverblue is kind of called as pet containers. So pet containers are basically like I probably would have containers for different projects, but what if uh, I need a container which does a lot of stuff for me. Be, uh, it can be a regular container for me. Like in virtual NV, I used to have a temp virtual NV where I used, I used to ins just install random uh, packages in it just to or to test things in it. So pet containers is very well managed by this project called Toolbox. It's still in a heavy, heavy, heavy development stage. So a lot of things would be coming in in the future. Uh, the next thing is Flatpak. So, if you have heard of Flatpaks, is basically a lot of apps are getting migrated into Flatpaks, and uh, so you have the Flat Hub from where you can install uh, this, uh, install the application via Flatpak. And uh, like probably for me, like most of the probably the PDF reader or the uh, maybe the Spotify client, all are running from my uh, laptop is running via Flatpak and. It has a vast, uh, the flat hub actually contains a vast, app, uh, it has a lot of application in there to install. And uh, the future plans for is like we are getting more uh, RPM OS3 support and flat pack into the GNOME so software so you can directly install it via the GNOME software center. And then uh, we would be doing a federal toolbox release uh, with more development in place. And uh, right now, flat packs are not installed directly on the Silver Blue. So, probably down the line, when we are doing the final release, you would be finding flat packs as a part of the release itself. And we are looking for faster downloads so that uh, the downloads that happen and uh, so the RPM OS3 downloads that happen via Silver Blue, we are trying to make it more optimized and faster. Right now, it kind of takes more time than DNS, but we are looking for a more faster download in that case. And in a distant future plan, we would be having more uh, toolbox integration. Basically, you would uh, so if you are you basically if you are on your terminal, so there would be kind of a visual uh, difference on uh, if you are inside your container or not, or are, are you on a host or not. So those all things we would, we would be working on in the future uh, releases. There would be, uh, we would be targeting more uh, uh, container available to the community. It's like probably make things around it and have like TensorFlow container or like um, maybe a, um, a image uh, processing containers in place so that it becomes easier for people to use Silver Blue on a daily basis rather than writing their Docker files or uh, creating their containers from scratch. 
and uh, right now like using Chrome and VirtualBox are kind of difficult to use uh, because of the display uses. So in that case, we would be trying to have more uh, difficult conta containers for uh, the community done by the people who are building Silverblue itself. So it's basically towards the end, we are trying to have a more better UX and UI for the general public. And we are trying to make like the Silver Blue as the de facto workstation for Fedora. So uh, now what? So going forward, how can you contact us? So we have our, our Discord. Uh, sorry, um, it's I forgot the name. It's not Discord. Anyway, so we have um, uh, discussion.fedoraproject.org uh, where you can post your comments in there. We have silverblue.fedoraproject.org where we uh, usually have questions in place. So. If you're new to uh, Silverblue, you can just go in there, ask for questions. Or since uh, everybody is starting out with Silverblue, there are quite common questions. Me starting as a newbie, I found a couple of questions there itself in the uh, community platform. Or you can directly go to Silverblue on Freenode IRC, join them, and uh, you can probably ask the question in there itself. So, questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, so you can. So the question is like, uh, can the Silver Blue gives you something from the OS level to launch your application, or you have to do it manually? Right. Right. So uh, we don't have we right now. So what I do is I uh, some I have kind of make files in place. So what I do is uh, using those make files, I manage my containers. Basically, running the Podman containers itself. Probably in the future, we can have those GUI support so that uh, even through GUI, you are actually running the container. That could be a better approach. But right now. It's just plain. Uh, I'm. I use myself uh, a lot of make files in that case and run those, manage those Podman containers to attach or uh, start or run those containers. Yeah. Yeah, Flatpak would like you can search it through your GNOME uh, uh, search bar and install them. Uh, you can start those uh, applications. So that would be simple. Uh, yes. So uh, we are probably deprecating those. Uh, so basically, we are deprecating. You won't have those alpha beta uh, channels like in Core OS. Yeah, but in Silverblue, it's uh, you can just you have the image. Uh, so we usually in Fedora have composers, which happens on a daily basis. And uh, how Fedora works is you uh, usually have this uh, rawhide or uh, the stable one. So you can usually do RP Moistry upgrade and whatever packages are there, which have been there in the uh, upgrade in that particular uh, OS in that day, probably it would just download it and layer it over on top of it. So yeah, but we don't have those uh, different channels. And uh, Cine after this would be talking on Fedora Core OS on how we mi are migrating to from container Linux to the Fedora Core OS project in general. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. 
uh, I don't think so. In, is there is any limit on layer packages? But usually, layer pa uh, it's recommended to use more of containers rather than layer packages. That's what I have read from the uh, got it from the discussions and uh, the blogs that I read. So yeah, so if you have questions, you can probably drop me an email or uh, ping me on Twitter. So that's the end of the talk. Hopefully I did a good sales pitch. Yeah, thank you.